We're here today in Salisbury at Arundel's, the home of Sir Edward Heath, to celebrate an exhibition by Martin Jennings of his work uh, titled Poets, Plumbers and Politicians. And we're going to learn an insight about how you created these uh, over your career, which in some respects started here 30 years ago. They did indeed, yes. It's uh, more or less exactly 30 years since I modelled uh, Ted Heath's portrait in this very room. And I came down here with some trepidation because I hadn't, I was still young, I hadn't met famous people before. I was shown into the garden and uh, after a while he wandered out to, to meet me, asked how I would like him to be dressed for this portrait. <laughs> uh, I'm being told that uh, he was expected by the Oxford Union to be wearing a suit and tie. He groaned uh, w with a profound despair, uh, wandered back into the house, came out with a, a jacket and tie on, and with, he had uh, purposefully selected perhaps the grubbiest pair of boating trousers that he owned because I wasn't going to be making a portrait below the waist. And <laughs> this was his statement of uh, rebellion. But he had a wonderful, friendly dry humour, uh, but the kind that is always keeping a young whippersnapper like I was then on his toes. So he would uh, come in for the sittings. Uh, we did the sittings in this very room. It was a hot August. And how many we, hours of time are you having to work with him? I could do sittings? two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. One of the things I did learn quite quickly was that it's a bad idea to attempt to model the portrait of a man of a certain age uh, immediately after they've had lunch because they tend to fall asleep and so Ted did, he, Ted did exactly that. He, um, 2 30 in the afternoon his head would sink down to his chest and uh, a sort of snoring sound would, <laughs> would come out of him. It was a hot summer day, the bees were buzzing against the window and I was thinking well how do you wake up an ex-prime minister yeah, that's um, a good question. <laughs> so very gently I said, um, Sir Edward, you're asleep. And there was no response at all. So I raised my voice a bit. And, Sir Edward, you're asleep. And his head shot up. He said, I was not sleeping. I was thinking. Uh, so there was, <laughs> there was a certain amount of that. Yeah. You're in this room. He's sitting where? He's sitting just behind where I am. So the piano was always here? The piano was there. So he's sitting there and he's sitting on a stool which is you can rotate him around on. He's sitting on what we sculptors call the throne, okay. which is a, a box with a revolving chair on top of it. So you can turn your sit around. And, and so it's Edward's sitting here. You're over here somewhere. I was standing by the window there. By the window. Are you drawing at this stage or are you, no, are you working? No, you go straight into the clay. Straight into clay. Yes. On a, on a, on a plinth and there you are working, yes. working it like that. Amazing. Yes, probably three feet away from him. You need to be able to talk because you need to, as it were, take the temperature of your sitter. You need to know who they are mm. and the quality of the conversation, what they reveal about themselves, feeds itself into the work, not through any uh, directly conscious process, but because you change because of the company that you're keeping and uh, what you uh, discover about them goes into the work. How did you make sure you got the right responses from him? You keep the conversation going because you need your sitter to be animated. What is difficult is to maintain a, an equal conversation because all the time you're having a conversation with yourself about what the next move is with the piece of yeah. sculpture. Got to keep observing. You've got to keep observing and you have a limited amount of time. Somebody like him would have become very impatient had I taken more days over it. But it was all done with a, a twinkle and a smile, and I liked him very much. The title of this exhibition is Poets, Plumbers and Politicians, but you've got a Queen in here as well, so how did that come about? Uh, again, this was a commission. I was asked by the Friends of St Paul's Cathedral to make a bust of the Queen Mother for her approaching 100th birthday, and that was a, a wonderful opportunity, not least because she was a, an important historical figure, you know, you can say that perhaps about somebody who is a hundred years old. Yeah, yeah. You're thinking all the time about who somebody is, how you're making your sculpture, about the anatomy uh, and then the details of the face. And anatomically it was extraordinary to have the opportunity to scrutinise somebody of such advanced age. And so important. 
and so important so that you're making a portrait of somebody and your research has included film footage from the 1920s. You work at eye level with your sitter and I find the only way I could work at eye level with her was to kneel on the floor. So I spent all of the sittings kneeling on the floor in front of her. She made no comment about this. Maybe she was used to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Isn't that quite funny? And you probably felt that was your natural place. You should be. I, I felt this was thoroughly appropriate. <laughs> yes. A lot of your work is actually not living people. And I'm, I'm intrigued as an auctioneer and handling sculpture is that you've obviously got to now work from people that you're not in front of. And it must be a so, such a different and perhaps more difficult process. How does that work? Uh, these are public monuments and statues. You don't have a sitter. You may have film footage. More likely, you'll only have photographs. But the reading research is very important. Um, and that's true as well of writers, authors, poets, of whom I have several represented in the exhibition. You, you read their works as much as you read about them because uh, you learn as much about... Um, what it is that people have responded to in that author. So yeah, to make a, a statue of John Betjeman for St Pancras Station, I read all of his poetry a couple of times over, not only because I then selected some quotations to carve um, in inscriptions set into the uh, station platform, but also because the poetry informed the mood of the statue. The sculpture of John Betjeman is in St Pancras Station. What made you choose the way he was modelled? Part of my intention was to make a, as it were, a triangular relationship between sculpture, poetry and architecture, so that the figure is directly related to the, the building. Uh, you follow his gaze up at what is you're already looking at, uh, the roof above you. The poetry uh, that I inscribed below him, which was taken from a poem called Cornish Cliffs, describes the awe with which Betjeman himself looked up at the cliffs in Cornwall and I think stemmed from the same emotional base as the kind of awe that we all have uh, for great buildings. Uh, public sculpture should inform the space it occupies as much as the space should inform the sculpture and that was what I was attempting there. With another sculpture I made of Mary Seco, uh, in the grounds of St Thomas's Hospital next to Westminster Bridge. Again, the direction that she's facing is very significant. She's striding forward directly towards the Houses of Parliament across the river. So it is relevant what your statue is, is looking at and the direction in which they're facing. One of your uh, subjects that I'm really fond of is George Orwell. And I've walked past him outside the Broadcasting House in London. Tell me a little about what the words you selected and, and, and how that sculpture came about. He was a subject to whom I was most drawn and the sculpture was made specifically for the site. Uh, he was raised up on a plinth. You might think that for someone like George Orwell they should be standing with their feet firmly on the ground but I thought there was a kind of um, finger wagging aspect to him and uh, there was a great big stone wall behind the sculpture uh, he'd have been rather lost had he been down on the ground. I needed to raise him up. I then thought, OK, what can we do to use this plinth? Maybe it looks a bit like a soapbox. So he's leaning forwards from it. He's waving a roll up. He was forever smoking. The words that uh, we chose, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear, is, as it were, a declaration of the need for freedom of speech. Having had a sneak preview of your exhibition, we've got small figures as well as um, the full-size bust. So, but the process of making a, a life-size figure must start somewhere. So how does that start? You design your statue for the site. The site is chosen first. I made a tiny little model that Orwell's son, Richard Blair, who was involved in discussions, thought looked too much like a journalist and not quite enough like a writer. So we put him in a jacket. But he wasn't in great health a lot of his life either. He wasn't. He, he was a, a tall man with a kind of Etonian upright bearing. Um, and yet, like many very tall people, he, he stooped down in order not to appear to be quite so tall. But he also was, I think, protective of his chest. He had tuberculosis for a number of years and eventually he died of it. So I wanted to represent 
a slightly inhibited man physically, even though he wasn't inhibited intellectually. So all of this went into the statue and at the different sizes of models or maquettes, the sculpture changes until you resolve it in the finished piece. When you have your finished sculpture and you present it, what's the reaction of your sitters? People can tend to be rather nonplussed by representations of themselves. I remember uh, Sir Edward's response uh, as I drove off with the finished piece of work. He was standing at the front door here of Arundel's and he said, well, it's only a very dim representation of your sitter, laughing as he said it. And I thought, oh dear, I've worked so hard. He's, uh, he's not happy. But uh, a week later, I had a phone call from his private secretary saying that he was sufficiently pleased with it to want to buy a copy for himself. Wow. So I think that actually he thought that it had worked. So you've worked on people who are both alive and no longer with us. Of all those subjects, which is the one that's most meaningful for you? In the exhibition there's a portrait of my father uh, that I did uh, before he died. He had heart disease and I wanted to spend time with him. He himself as a young man had been badly burned in a tank battle in the Second World War and so his face, uh, he had had plastic surgery. His face had been, as it were, re-sculpted by his surgeon. The team who had worked on him had been under the direction of the famous uh, Second World War plastic surgeon, Sir Archibald Mackendo. Uh, at uh, a few years after my father died, I had a phone call asking me whether or not I'd like to make a statue for East Grinstead, where Queen Victoria Hospital had been, uh, where this pioneering plastic surgery had uh, been developed. The person inviting me said, you won't have heard of Archibald <laughs> Mackendo. And I was able to say not only had I heard of him, but he had been a great hero of our uh, family's past. For me, that was a very moving experience. Tell me now, uh, finally, a little bit about the exhibition and um, when people can come and see it. People can see the uh, exhibition by visiting Arundel's. Uh, there's the opportunity to see the house as well. The show is on for two and a half months until I think it's the 19th of July. So plenty of opportunity to come into the beautiful Cathedral Close and see this exhibition of my works. There's so much more to it than the conversations we've been able to have, but thank you very much. It's been brilliant. Thank, thank you. you.